Well, good morning, everyone. And good morning for those of you who are watching us, you sleepy heads, probably out there having another cup of coffee. We wish we could have right now. Uh, this is a day that the Lord has made, and it's still appropriate to say Merry Christmas. So I do have my uh, Magi tie on today, so it's kind of interesting. It looks about the same as this picture up here. So at this time, she will lead us forward in the announcements. Good morning. Good morning. Um, are there any announcements this morning? Yes. Right. Um, if you have a poinsettia and you would like to take one home today, you're more than welcome to. <laughs> um, I do have one announcement. The giving envelopes are downstairs, so if you'd like to take them with you today, or if you see any downstairs that you know of somebody who you would like to take them to, you can go ahead and take them, because we will be mailing them out this week, and we'd like to mail out the least amount possible. Did you have an announcement? All right. If there's no other announcements, then we'll stand for our call to worship. Out of the busyness of our world, out, out of, of the, the crankiness and boredom of life, life as, as usual, out of the darkness, we have seen a great light. Those who, who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, darkness on them has light shined. The birth of a baby calls us to something special. Let, Let us worship be our new beginning. beginning. Amen. Amen. Please join in our opening prayer. O oh God, the tinsel, the tinsel falls, the year turns, and the carols fade. The blessing of Bethlehem that touched all the gray in our lives with silver star is past. We read that the holy child grew and became strong, and God's favor was with him. In this string of nameless days, we long for such steady becoming, for renewal amid the routine, for courage in current events, for the assurance of God's presence beyond our holidays and into the wintering times of our lives. Amen. Our opening hymn this morning is O Thou Joyful. Please be seated. What a joy it is that these many, many years later that we celebrate the birth of Jesus who, come, who came into our world, a world of darkness, when Quirinius was governor. And that God comes again and again and again every Christmas into our hearts to give us that gift of love, that gift of peace, that gift of hope, that gift of joy. It is ours for the taking. Just don't leave that present unwrapped. That means because he loves us that much and will always be there to love us, that we can confess our sins, knowing that God is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. So in a spirit of confession, would you please join together with me at this time in our prayer of confession. Let us pray. Jesus Christ, God with us, you came that we may have life and have it more abundantly. 
we have not always lived up to your expectations for us. We confess that too often we are impoverished of spirit. Grant us the fullness of grace. Wrapped up in ourselves, open us up to others, slow to learn. Teach us of your ever-expanding truth, distracted of mine. Direct us to what is most important, your love for us, your will for our lives, and your sustaining presence in every circumstance. Please join me in our assurance of pardon liturgy. Through Christ, the dividing walls have been broken down. We have been handed the hope that we can live. Such a gift surely sets us free. We are free. And that God has chosen us, shining forth in the world with love. routine right now. It's uh, do the hokey pokey and turn yourself around time. Greet each other in Christian love, a holy hug. I know those who want the hugs in the back, I'll give them to you. But let's greet each other. Good morning, Mark. It's just to keep our people safe. So I know we all desperately want to bump shoulders. Testament reading this morning is Psalm 148. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. 
Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. He established them forever and ever. He fixed their bounds, which cannot be passed. Praise the Lord from the earth, you sea monsters and all deeps, fire and hail, snow and frost, stormy wind fulfilling his command, mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, wild animals and all cattle, creeping things and flying birds, kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the earth, young men and women alike, old and young together, let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His glory is above earth and heaven. He has raised up a horn for his people. Praise for all his faithful. For the people of Israel who are close to him. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord indeed. Thank you, Sheila. The gospel lesson, of course, we're going to be talking about the uh, Magi, those wise guys that we talked about, in Matthew 2, verses 13 through 18. And by the way, we will be having a Bible study. I forgot to mention during the announcement time, for those who wish to come, um, we will be discussing those wise guys, those Magi. Now, after they had left, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt. And remain there until I tell for you, until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Then Joseph got up, he took the child and his mother by night, and went to Egypt, and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Out of Egypt I have called my son. Now when Herod saw that he had been tricked by those wise men, he was infuriated, and he sent and killed all the children in and around Bethlehem who were two years of age and under, according to the time that he had learned from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, wailing and loud lamentation. Rachel, weeping for her children, refused to be consoled because they are no more. And may God's blessing be added to sharing this God's word. We have something very special this morning for our children's moment. And so I would invite um, Cade and, and Calise, come on up. And we're going to just, uh, we're, going to sit and listen, we're going to sit and listen to your song first, okay? And then, and then I will sit so I don't make you nervous. And then when you're done, after the applause... We'll sit down and talk about it, okay? Go ahead, Kate. All I want for Christmas is my two front teeth. See my two front teeth. All I want for Christmas is my two front teeth. Then I could wish you Merry Christmas. It seems so long since I could say, Sister Sudi sitting on a thistle. Gosh, oh gee, how happy I be. If I could only whistle. <laughs> All I want for Christmas is my two front teeth. See my two front teeth. All I want for Christmas is my two front teeth. Then I could wish you Merry Christmas. Then I could wish you Merry Christmas. All right. <laughs> yep. Where are y'all going? No, she's coming back. <laughs> Give me five. All right, sit down. Well, we've got a future here. We're going to teach them some new songs, too. Now, you might be thinking, now, so you missing those two front teeth? It's kind of bright? Oh, yeah. You know, I'm missing one over here, but mine won't grow back like yours are growing. So, but let's, we talk about, you know, wishing. You looking forward to getting that new tooth? Are you? You know, God is a giver of all kinds of gifts. And one of those gifts is, because Kate came up to me on Christmas Eve, 
And I, I know Grandpa was saying, you guys were talking about it for some time. He came up to me on Christmas Eve after the service and said, can I sing? And I said, sure. Because here's the thing we, we come to discover and use here in the church are our gifts. And one of those gifts is a gift of song, the gift of youth, all of those kinds of things. You make a difference. We're going to remember this song. And, and by the way, it's a dynamite sw uh, sweater you got on there. So, but, uh, but how did it feel to sing that song? We're going to teach you some, some church songs too, you know, because God gives us those gifts. So you'd be willing to do that? I know your sister's done it. So just thinking, maybe we'll have a duet or a family, a family sing here. So we can, we get some new members for our fa-la-la singers. So, so anyway, so thank you, Kate, for doing that and sharing your gift with us and brightening our day because that's how God uses us. So let's have a word of prayer and you go back. Gracious God, thank you for all the gifts that all of our young people bring and are developing. We ask God that you help. We, we, we seek your encouragement and our encouragement of them to share those gifts to bring, to brighten our days and, and to make, you know, to, to make better known in our world all the peace, hope, love, and joy that you offer. God bless you guys. Have a great day. Thank you for singing. Some could sing, all I want for Christmas is a new by custard, but that's an implant. That'll wait. <laughs> And by the way, the tag, as you probably know, replacing a tooth like that uh, cost a little more than the parents who have, play the whole, you know, um, fairy thing. So <laughs> just, just saying. Would you join me in a moment, a moment of prayer? God, may the words which I'm about to utter and a privilege that I now assume be acceptable in your sight. Amen. Today we're talking about leaving in a hurry. Anybody ever have to leave someplace in a hurry? Who here has ever had to leave someplace in a hurry? Okay. Um, I remember once, and, and this is kind of off script, but feeding into what we're going to talk about today. Um, as you know, I get called out by our police fire department things. I remember one winter, one winter, it was close to St. Boniface Church, there's a subdivision over there. I was called over there. Family had to hurriedly leave their home in the middle of the night. It was cold. And, and so they just had whatever they were sleeping in or grabbed a bathrobe. And um, meanwhile, you know, the family dog was missing, but the dog actually had run off, so we were able to find it. But here the family had nothing, and they had to leave in a hurry. Now, I, I think about those kinds of situations, you know, and then trying to put your life back together again. The, you know, maybe Mary and Joseph had a little more preparation, but it sounds like, when you read between the lines, they had to get out of there. So I, I think about that, and I think about those things where we feel kind of discombobulated because we've had to throw ourselves, we had to get out in a hurry or do whatever it is in a hurry, and what am I going to take, what am I going to take? You really have a chance to think about that, you know, especially if somebody's knocking on your door and said, get out, you know, like it's a forest fire. Robert Orban says that city young people have a difficult time understanding the Christmas story. Now, some of you folks come out of farm backgrounds. You say, you say that's true? I've seen the movie City Slickers. Of course, that's a ranch. Um, when he said that Mary and Joseph had to spend a night in the stable, his daughter said, what's a stable? I understand, city folk. Uh, and he said, picture your room without a stereo. And that's, that's, uh, that's still a lot nicer than, that's still an upgrade from, from the stereo. Ron Guion had a recurring dream about a 250-foot fir tree near their house. He dreamed that the tree fell on the house, crumpling the roof and splintering through the living room and front bedroom with a sickening, thunderous roar. Now, unfortunately, that's happened too many times, especially with some of the strong wind storms we've had. Each nightmare would wake him up in a drenching sweat. And all of his dreams were, were vivid and they were frightening. And he warned his children to stay away from that old tree. We may have had trees on our property where you kind of think, oh boy. In fact, there's one we have a place up north, and it's like, you know, and eventually it would come down, but not when we're there. But it's kind of leaning over, you know, and you keep thinking, oh, geez. And you see holes in it, and it's like, uh, maybe we should take this down, you know. Um, but you, you, you steer clear of it until you can do that. Uh, so he, he asked himself, what do all these dreams mean, though? This Ron Guillaume. One day he noticed a 20-foot dead limb dangling from the tree. And a neighbor helped him cut that dead limb 
off. And as Christmas approached, the dream subsided. Ron and Nina, his wife, Nita, his wife, returned home from Christmas shopping to find their nine-year-old daughter, Allison, had rearranged her bedroom. She had been talking about it for days, but her mother asked her to wait until after the holidays. I just want to get it done now, she explained. On Christmas Eve, it started to snow as the family made their way to church. I hunched in the pew with my arms folded tightly, Ron recalls, thinking about whether I even believed that God was a part of my life. Now, we've all had those dark nights of the soul. It was near blizzard conditions by the time they reached home. Now, we had the fog on Friday, didn't we? I'm glad everybody got home safely. Ron wasn't asleep for very long when he heard a roar. The old fir tree had fallen on their house, just like he'd seen in their dream. Allison across the hall was crying for help. Daddy, help! I'm stuck! All, all Ron could see was branches, insulation, and hunks of ceiling strewn about the trunk. Somewhere in that mess, Allison was crying underneath all of that. Daddy! Daddy! And he felt hopeless. Soon the quiet night was filled with the sound of rescuers with chainsaws, frantically sawing parts of the big tree very carefully in an effort to free Allison. Because, you know, obviously, if you know anything about cutting trees and branches, you have to be careful how you cut it so when the weight shifts. Um, hours passed, and still they were unable to free the girl. This went on for a long time. This was a huge tree. There was a threat of Allison now getting hypothermia. The rescues finally, though, after feverish work, were able to free his daughter. At the hospitals, the doctor said she'd be all right. Thank God. The next day, Christmas Day, Ron and his son kicked through the rubble of their house. In Allison's room, he noticed that the bulk of the tree landed where her bed, bed had been before she impulsively moved it. He noticed a scar in the tree and realized it was from the dead branch that he had felt such an urgency to remove. That branch might have killed her. Amid the rubble, Ron wondered, has God been trying to warn me all along about the tree? I know we talked, Dave, last, last Sunday about dreams. You know, do I believe that God speaks to us in dreams? I said, yeah, we have to be really careful, though, uh, because there are a lot of people claiming that they are the voice of God. But uh, it's not one of those things. For me, it was more of a thought, but I've got my own personal stories. Does God speak? I believe God does. Telling, but he told Joseph in a dream to take Mary and his wife and the baby, his, his wife, and to, and to name her baby Jesus because he would save their people from sins. And then Joseph believed the angel, and he and Mary were, mar uh, Mary were married. Later they would travel to Bethlehem. There was, of course, in a stable where the baby Jesus was born, and he was named Jesus. The next few days were dramatic. There were all kinds of visitors. First, there were those shepherds we talked about. They knelt before the baby and told Mary and Joseph about their encounter with angels when they were out watching their flocks. The shepherds were excited. Could you imagine? Put yourself in their shoes. Sometime later, there were three other visitors. And this was some time because we'll be talking about them. They came from some great distance away, from the east. Then opening, of course, their, tre their, their treasure chests, they were all very symbolic gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. All of this occurred during the reign of a king named good old Herod. Herod was really upset, as I said in the scripture, that a new king was born. A new king? I'm a king. What's going on here? He didn't want any rivals. He was very jealous. In, an angel, in a dream, an angel once spoke to Joseph, this time with an urgent warning. Get up. Take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt. Herod was on a rampage searching for this child. He was serious about destroying any rival, real or imagined. So Joseph woke Mary, and they headed immediately for Egypt. The trip, now get this, the trip to Egypt would take 10 long, hard days of traveling 20 miles a day with a little baby. They weren't traveling in an SUV. They were traveling in a, a big, fancy pickup truck. They were traveling in a bus or a train. I'm going to start on like Dr. Seuss here in a minute. But it was like they, they averaged about 20 miles a day, as best estimated, 
200 miles is, is the estimate distance. Might not seem like a great distance to us, but Mary had given birth to a child, and they had to flee to Egypt at some point early on here. Um, and could you imagine traveling the way that they did? The beast of burden? That would be like moving halfway around the world in their world. During those 10 days, the holy couple was filled with fear. What would happen if some soldiers spotted them heading south to the border? How, how do you look unhurried when you're in such a hurry to escape with such a precious child that you're responsible for? How do you look inconspicuous when you feel that your wife and child just glow with a divine promise, and therefore threaten a reigning king? Just as God watched the ancient Israelites trek to Egypt, God watched out for Mary, Joseph, and the baby Jesus, and whew, they arrived safely. I think one of the reve truths revealed to us, and I think we know that, um, in this passage is that even in the worst of times that God is still with us. As often you'll hear me say during a funeral service when I share the 23rd Psalm, uh, there's, there's a particular phrase I always lift up. Even though I walk, or yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. The shadow of death. Not a good place to be, right? You are with me. That's how the rest of that phrase goes. Just to remind us that God is with us. As Isaiah prophesied long before the birth of Jesus, it was no, no messenger or angel, but his presence that saved him. Now, Thomas Dorsey, some, some of you heard, now there's a Tommy Dorsey, but Thomas Dorsey knew what it meant to find God's presence, even in the worst of times. We remember the story of Longfellow, all of those stories, the things that people do out of the midst of their pain and grief, or their difficulty, or their crisis. Here's another one. Dorsey is a composer of many well-known gospel songs. And David, you probably sung some. Dennis, you probably sung some of them. In fact, I, when I list them, I know you have, because one of them I've listed, I remember you, lovely, you sang so lovely, uh, Dennis, in that. But it was in August of 1932, Dorsey was scheduled to be the featured soloist at religious services in St. Louis. Because his wife, Nettie, was pregnant, Dorsey had reservations about leaving her behind. Something was strongly telling me to say, to stay, he recalls. Yet commitments had been made, and he knew that many, many people in St. Louis would be disappointed if he canceled. So Tom Dorsey left for a revival service. And during the performance the next night in the steaming heat in St. Louis, a messenger from Western Union approached Dorsey on the stage with a telegram. Puzzled, Dorsey opened the envelope and read four devastating words. Your wife just died. He rushed to a phone, because people didn't have cell phones back then, only to hear it confirmed, Nettie's dead. Dorsey, understandably, was devastated, and he felt horribly guilty. So Dorsey quickly returned to Chicago. There he learned that, that just before his wife died, she also gave birth to a little boy. Later that night, to compound the tragedy, the baby boy died. Dorsey now had to deal with two losses, two funerals. I buried Nettie and our boy in the same casket, he says. Then I fell apart. And during this, this painful, dark time, one of Dorsey's friends made arrangements for him to use a local music school's piano. There, kind of alone with his thoughts, because that was where he was most at home. And a piano, Dorsey describes what happened. I sat down at the piano, and my hands began to browse over the keys. Didn't really have much in mind. Then something happened. I felt as though I could reach out and, and touch God in that moment. I found myself playing a melody, one I'd never heard before or played, and words came into my head just as they seemed to fall into place. Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, let me stand. I am tired, I am weak, I am worn. Through the storm, through the night, lead me on to the light. Take my hand, precious Lord, lead me home. Almost had you get up and sing that part for us, Dennis, but 
But uh, yeah, I, I knew that you would instantly recognize it. Now you know the rest of the story. Dorsey would work through his grief. He would go on to write and compose more than 400 gospel songs, including We Will Meet by the Sweet By and By, Stand By Me, and There Will Be Peace. But it was Precious Lord that established Tom Dorsey as the architect of gospel music, and it endeared him to people around the globe. Tom Dorsey knew that God was with him, even in the worst of times. Another truth I think, I think is revealed here is that the hope of the world resides in this child whose parents had to flee with them to Egypt. The world's hope resided in this tiny baby whose parents fled to, to safety in Egypt. That is why he must be protected at all costs. It was he that the world had awaited for for so long. Now all of us have those signs, keep Christ in Christmas. And, and, you know, I, I don't, I'm preaching to the choir when I say this because I know we did that. Um, but there are many people who celebrate Christmas who have no idea that, that, that Christ is the hope of the world. In the time of King Herod, Jesus was born. What Matthew meant was that in the worst of times, in the darkest of times, the days that Herod was king, Jesus was born in those times because Jesus was born at such a time that we can have hope even in times of uncertainty. Frank Hinnant, Hinnant, head of his own multi-million dollar, my last story, contracting business. He had no use for Christmas. We all know people like that. Bah humbug. I have no use for Christmas. He gave no Christmas bonuses. Adele, his wife, loved Christmas and loved to decorate. Each year he had arguments about decorating around the house. Nonsense, Frank would say. Christmas is for children. Probably with the attitude of a dog that I saw on Christmas morning when I was out doing my rucking work out in Altbauer Park, working my way south. This lady all full of cheer, because I had a Santa hat on. She, she sees me and she's just full of cheer and she yells out Merry Christmas. And she's walking the most saddest looking dog I've ever seen in my life. It's like a, it's like a cocker, cocker spaniel type dog. And, and as she's walking by her dog, if a dog could look glum, you know, like Eeyore the donkey, if you know what I'm talking about. That dog looked at it, and I said to her, I said, well, Merry Christmas to you, but your dog doesn't look like it shared that same spirit. And she started laughing. I said, he's probably wondering when this walk will be over. One brisk December morning, this Frank decided to walk to work. And as he's walking through town, <coughs> excuse me, he noticed a group of people standing in front of a department store window looking at the beautiful Christmas displays like they used to do in some places. They still do, do, probably in New York, they probably still do. I know they do in Chicago some. When I did my training, I would often look at those. Frank paused at one window to see Mary Joseph and the shepherds in colorful costumes, and there was the child. Frank turned away, and he started to move. He noticed a sign across the street, Holy Innocence Home. It said in large round letters, Frank stood there staring, it was an orphanage, staring at that orphanage. Yet in his mind, he saw something else. He remembered years before a Sunday school teacher telling class about King Herod and all the male children under the age of two. He remembered how innocent children were killed. Then it dawned on him, there's more to Christmas than syrup, to use his words. There's misery too. And we all know, we talked about that on Christmas Eve, those we've lost, that empty chair at the table, we've all had to suffer that. At that moment, Frank remembered his own son who had died at the tender age of 18 months. David had died some 22 years before. It was still difficult for Frank to even mention David's name aloud, although he thought about him many times. You know, you know how it is. That evening, Frank and Adele dined alone, and I went to visit the orphanage, he told his wife. She, she never imagined that he would do such a thing. She thought, what's gotten into my husband? He told her about the conditions he found inside. It was really like a dungeon. It was cramped, and it was dismal. And as he was visiting, a little boy came up to him and touched the sleeve of his coat. 
just touch the sleeve of his coat. Like I told you about the kid who hugged my leg at Chop with a Cop that one year. I'll never forget that. Similar kind of thing. He said, I'll never forget it. You know full well what I've always said about Christmas, he said. Christmas is for children. Well, it's about time, his words, that, that, that people started doing something for them. Today I gave that place some money. They're going to build a wing with it. Adele was swept away and surprised by his kindness. She was unprepared for his next statement. They're going to name it for their deceased son, David. When Herod died, an angel of God once again spoke to Joseph in a dream. Get up, take the child and his mother, and go back to the land of Israel. For those who were seeking the child's life are dead. Once again, Joseph obeyed without questioning. They picked up and returned to their home where they would raise his Jesus until he would become a man and began his ministry. The Holy Family had no more certainty about that future held for them than we do today on this last Sunday of 2021. But they, they knew three things. They knew that no matter how bad things got, God was with them. They knew that the child they protected was the savior of the world. And they knew that at the center of faith is hope and love. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and went back to Israel. And might we say, the rest is history. Praise be to God. Would you join me in a moment of prayer? Gracious God, we thank you. We thank you that We thank you that through that difficult and very perilous time that you were protected, that you could come back, grow up, and begin and complete the ministry that you were sent to earth to complete and to inspire human hearts, to launch new dreams to launch a hope that the world so desperately needed and needs today. We thank you, God, that you are our God. We are your people. So I'm going to put my mask on. I'm going to walk down there, and we're going to do the concerns and, and joys and concerns so that everybody can hear. And I presume my microphone's still working so everybody out there can hear. So as we continue in our prayer time, I'd like to ask what prayers of joy or concern would you like to lift up? And Marge will start back with you. We'll wait till I get back there. Please. Thankfulness that our, my sister Janet is improving very quickly and is feeling good. It's a blessing. Christ in your mercy. Oh, hear our prayer. For those of you who are watching, uh, Janet is improving and doing very well, and we are very thankful for that. Can't wait to see her again when she's got the strength. So, indeed, thank you. Other prayers this morning. Prayer of thanks for you to share your gift and that you will get that new truth eventually. Christ in your mercy. Any other prayers this morning? All right. Would you join me in prayer? Gracious and always loving God, we thank you. In this season of Christmas tide, that you are still there. It is our prayer, God, that of all the presents of love that were exchanged and thoughtfully given to each other, the greatest gift of all is the gift of love. Let us pray, God, that that is not a package that we've left under our trees, unwrapped. That is the greatest gift of all. And you shared that with us. People who are struggling around the world, God, are heavy in our hearts and our thoughts. Those, we pray for Jim. He continues struggling and fighting courageously with his cancer. Jim, you and your family, please know that you are in our prayers, as I'm sure you know that already. But we say it. 
And those like Janet who are healing and beginning to heal really well, we thank you for, for little Cade and, and his willingness to share his gift with us. And we look forward to God, to the other gifts that, that, that he and others and his family can give as they give so much in sharing and enriching our ministry. God, for those who are suffering and alone, we pray that we can be ambassadors reaching out to them in whatever darkness that is holding them prisoner. We pray, God, that we can be, as we go forth, that light. You are the light of the world. You give us that light that we carry forth from this day forward, that we can be that light to others in the darkness. And now together, heart to heart in this time, we join together and we join and share the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples by praying our Father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever Amen. Freely and richly has God given to us. So at this time, having shared those gifts when we came in this morning, um, Mark will play a, a song of dedication and joy for our sharing. Gracious and always loving God, we would ask you to accept these gifts, which we, your people, offer up to you. Grant that the causes to which they're devoted be causes of love given to your glory. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray, we share, and we live. Amen.
tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. The lepers kept to watching for silent flocks by night. Behold, throughout the heaven, they turn the holy light. Go tell it on the Tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. The shepherds feared and trembled when low above the earth rang out the angel chorus and hailed our Savior's birth. Go tell it on the mountain over the hills and earth. Sent us salvation that blessed Christmas morn. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. in faith and in love.